Well, good morning, my friends, and good morning to those of you who are joining us online. I'm so glad that you're with us, and especially here in person. Um, so I got here, and I, I packed certain clothes because I, you know, I checked the weather and stuff, and then, and then you guys decided to have a heat wave. Uh, but I'll tell you that my blood acclimated quickly, and uh, in the mornings I was like, you know, it was like 70-something, right, in the mornings, and uh, I, was, I was chilly. And I was like, I guess I live here now. Because um, I, I can't go back to Boston. So I would talk to my family, and they were wearing sweaters. And, uh, you know, because it was cold there. But then I was like, well, today it's going to be like 90 degrees. So anyway, uh, my family is here. Um, Roger and Noah, they're right over here. Hi. They knew I was going to say hello. Um, but also, I have two amazing pastor friends who are here, um, Deb and Ruby. So thank you for being here. Um, it's, it's always an honor to actually have them because I, I really look up to them. And especially, yeah, Deb, you're like a mentor, so. You know, yeah. Um, I was surprised this morning because I got to help serve communion, and that is uh, one of my favorite things to do at church, is to serve communion, because I get to see each of your faces, and I get to um, share in God's table with each of you, and it's such a, it's a meaningful moment, because this table is for everyone. And it's just that reminder of the beauty that we get to see as I see each of your faces and we come and partake in this table that brings us together. So thank you for that. That was such an honor and privilege. All right, here we go. There's going to be a picture up here. Yes. All right. What do you see? There's a glass of water. Yes. How many of you see this as a half empty glass? Raise your hands. Half empty. You think it's half empty. It's okay. There's no judgment in this. And there's, everyone passes. Okay. How many of you see this as a half full glass? Oh, okay. All right. Then maybe I don't need to preach this sermon today. <laughs> You see, some of us, we all come with different mindsets, and some of us uh, see things with maybe more optimism, and others with more pessimism. And we're all built differently, and we come with different experiences that might lean us toward one way or another. And one isn't good and the other bad, I just, I want us to move away from that binary thinking on things. And as I said last Sunday, we're going to embrace the both and. The both and. And so you could say that when we look at this glass, one of the mindsets we can have about this is a scarcity mindset. I don't know if you've heard that. But psychologists define a scarcity mindset as a pattern of thinking that focuses on what you don't have and the underlying belief that you're not ever going to have the things that you want, even when you have access to basic needs like food, housing, water, housing, income, and so on. So let me just point out a really quick distinction here between scarcity, which is when you actually don't have the things necessary for survival, and the, the, the mindset, scarcity mindset. So when we talk about scarcity mindset, I don't want us to diminish the real anxiety, stress, and pain that not only comes from living in scarcity, but also from having a scarcity mindset. You see, a scarcity mindset can actually be played out in many different ways, including thinking that there's only one way to be a good parent, or that there's only one way to be a good friend, and then you get down on yourself because you don't meet that ideal. Or it could be that you're trying really hard to keep up with others. And it's common that when we are beholden to a scarcity mindset, that we feel like we're not going to be able to get the skills or the resources that are necessary to meet our goals, or feeling like there just isn't enough to go around. And sometimes it feels like you can only see the things that you don't have, and it's really hard to see what you do have or the possibilities that are actually available to you. And I want to remind us that this is actually real and valid. For some of our siblings here in this community, it's a lived reality of not having enough, of that scarcity. 
And I want to recognize the fears and the insecurities and the anger and all the other feelings that come from that lived reality. It's hard to trust that there's going to be enough when there hasn't been enough. And we just actually sang a song called Jaira, and the lyrics in there said, if God watches over the sparrows or clothes the lilies, how much more will God clothe us and God love us, right? But man, if your daily reality is that you don't have enough clothes, you don't have enough food, you don't have enough of anything, how are you going to trust? How are you going to sing that song and be like, oh yeah, God loves me. Oh yeah, God's going to clothe me. Man, I wouldn't be sure. I would not be sure of that. And so it's, the reality is that it is really hard if you don't have those things, and it's hard to hear that. So I, I just want to make sure that we understand that. And on the flip side, when you're talking about abundance mindset, you're talking about not feeling limited by the things that you don't have and having more of a focus on your opportunities or the possibilities of the opportunities that you may have before you. And as human beings, you're going to experience both of these mindsets and everything in between as you go through life. And would it, would it be okay if I share with you a little glimpse into my own life where I was deeply embedded with a scarcity mindset? Is that okay with you? Yes. All right. So um, my family and I, we used to live in Boston, in Jamaica Plain. And we were packing up that kitchen area, and I noticed that I had jars and jars and jars and jars. I just had empty jars. And I, I mean, it was a ridiculous amount of uh, pickle jars, kimchi jars, jam jars. My family can attest we still have jam jars. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of jars. And they once held some sort of food. But I think when I was moving, I realized I had packed up almost three boxes of just empty jars that I was going to move with me. And as I sat looking at all the jars that had taken up entire cabinets in my kitchen, and then now these boxes, I started to wonder to myself, why do I have all these jars? Why? And then it struck me, it was actually in my blood. It was in my blood to be a jar hoarder. Um, you see, I grew up in an immigrant family where we saved everything. I mean everything. Those tin containers of Danish cookies, do, you have, do we have that? Yeah, it never had Danish cookies. That was, that's where the sewing kit went. So if you ever went to grandma's house and you opened that, there were no cookies in there. Or almond roca, like they used to come in tins. And I would open it all excited to eat the candy. And lo and behold, there's like buttons in there, right? And I'm like, grandma, what happened to the almond roca? A long time ago, we ate them. Once the sweets or whatever was inside were consumed, they, they just became containers for other things. That Cool Whip container that's in the fridge, it does not have Cool Whip in it. <laughs> Never has Cool Whip in it. You know, the styrofoam trays from the grocery store that carries like either vegetables or meat. Well, in my house, those things got scrubbed clean and then reused as trays to freeze rows and rows of dumplings for my grandmother's wonton soup that she sold on Fridays at their little strip mall restaurant. Margarine containers usually held different kinds of panchan, which are like Korean side dishes. Old picker, pickle jars were reused for all different kinds of kimchi to share with others. And then the kimchi jars that were a little bit bigger, and I was so sad when they stopped selling kimchi in the glass jars. Um, those were reused to transport cooled down soup when a friend or relative was sick, or someone gives birth and then you gotta bring the seaweed soup. They're perfect for that. So growing up, we kept everything because they could always be repurposed and reused. And unbeknownst to me, I had become a collector of empty jars. But these jars sat empty, collecting dust in the back of my cabinets, taking up unnecessary space, and then just moved from place to place. And two weeks ago, I finally recycled most of those empty jars. And I have to tell you, I was really sad. Like I literally had to Marie Kondo and say to the jars, Thank you. 
and then put them in the recycling bin. And then in the back of my mind, I was thinking to myself, what if I can't get any more of these jars? It was real. But the reality is, is that actually we, we consume things like pickles and jam at a real fast, fast rate. Like we, our family just loves pickles, so we have tons of pickle jars. We have, you know, jars of pasta sauce, we have jars of olives, like all these things. And we actually have plenty of jars, actually more jars than what we would reuse them for. I would always have an excess of jars. Now the life that I live now is really different from the one that my grandparents and my immigrant parents lived. My grandparents lived through the occupation and war. So saving, reusing, repurposing, that was actually a necessity in life. My parents who immigrated with very little, my dad literally had one suitcase, had given away almost everything, including all of any money that he had saved. Saving, reusing, repurposing, it was a necessity in life for them. Scarcity was a reality. And so for some of you, we already talked about this, but that scarcity might actually be a reality. But then there are some of us here who are sitting here that it's not actually a reality, but then it's just, we've somehow embraced that mindset of scarcity. We may hoard our resources, our energy, or our time, and we make decisions based on the idea that there actually isn't enough for everyone. So you gotta just look out for yourself. And you might be asking now, Phyllis, what, what does this have to do with holistic formation? What does this have to do with the God, with God or the gospel? Well, we're going to turn to the scriptures and we're going to see what our main text of Matthew 14, 13 to 21 could reveal to us today. And I'm going to read it in the NLT version, but I do have it up here, but you can read it on, you know, device, Bible, whatever you want. It says this, as soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And then that evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. And Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. Amen. All right, so let's process this together. Matthew isn't the only place in the Bible where this story is actually told. You can look it up in Mark 6, verses 31 to 44, Luke 9, verses 12 to 17, and even in John um, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And, and so actually in John, if you read that, it says that the five loaves and two fish uh, was given by a young boy, a child. So make a note of that mentally, all right? Who did those loaves and fish come from? It was a little kid. All right, so prior to this, Jesus had been going around with his disciples, you know, and they'd been seeing miracles after miracle. It was like, no big deal. And, and they've been eyewitnesses, like direct eyewitnesses to Jesus' amazing power. And so Jesus is like, you know what, I'm a little bit tired, I need to get some rest. And so they go off to this remote place. But the crowds follow him. And every preacher knows that a hangry crowd is just no good. <laughs> I hope you all ate some breakfast. You know, in actuality, hospitality it is a huge value in Jewish culture as it is in many other cultures as well. And so if you know that someone is hungry and you, you, you want to feed them, in Jewish tradition, it was actually a legal obligation. So Jesus being Jew, Jesus uh, and Jewish knows that, hey, 
we need to feed this crowd, and so do the disciples. And when and asked to find food for the people, the, the disciples, well, they respond in the most human way possible. They tell Jesus, this is a remote area. There is no Dunkin' Donuts. There is no McDonald's. There is no in and out around here. And they say, Jesus, let the people go and like find, find some food. And he tells them, nah, these people don't have to go. You just, you feed them. And I can just imagine the disciples and they are looking at Jesus. And then they're looking at the crowd. And then they're looking back at Jesus. And finally, good old Andrew speaks up. And this is from the book of John. This little kid has five barley loaves and two fish. And Andrew says, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Some theologians speculate that there may have been about 15,000 people there. That 5,000 number was just counting men, right? It didn't include the women and children. So 15,000 on five loaves and two fish. Seems pretty impossible, right? So Jesus tells them to bring it over to him, and he instructs the crowd to sit down, and then he prays a blessing on the food, and then he starts breaking the bread and then giving it to the disciples. And this is when I really wish I could have been there, because I imagine Jesus is breaking the bread, and the disciples are passing it out, and the first basket goes by, and they're just like shaking their heads, being like Jesus, being all crazy again. And then another basket and then another basket, and another, and another, and it just keeps going. I mean, it doesn't even stop after everyone has eaten all they want. In fact, there are leftovers. And I'm not talking about like three pieces of bread leftovers. I'm talking about 12 baskets full of leftovers. Imagine that you're hosting a little party at the Hollywood Bowl. Now, the Hollywood Bowl holds about 17,000 people, apparently. And you're going to have to feed them. But your catering falls through, and all you have is the lunch that you brought. Two fish and five loaves of bread. What would you be thinking? It was an impossible situation, let's be honest. Scarcity mindset would have set in from the moment my stomach started gurgling with hunger, and I would have been thinking, how do I hide this food and eat it without anyone else noticing? Because they're going to ask me for some. And then someone else is going to ask. And then we're all still going to be hungry, and I'm not really sure how long this Jesus is going to be talking. You get the idea, right? What I am taking away from this passage first is this, is that God provides and there is more than enough. Yeah. But get this, we sometimes say this as a platitude, right? We, we just say, God provides, but we don't really mean it. We don't really believe it. And I want us to consider that this idea that God provides is actually a matter of faith. We sometimes think, that God providing is merely material things. And that we have definite ideas of how we want God to provide. Like we have the idea of like this is what it means for God to provide. I mean, I want God to provide for me a winning lottery ticket. (laughs) But on a more serious note, I want God to provide that my friend with cancer is going to survive. I want God to provide that my friends who were actually devastated by Hurricane Helene, that they're going to have shelter, clean water, and restoration. I mean, I want God to provide lots of things. And when we say that God provides, I want us to be aware that God provides in the way that God provides. Not in the ways that we want or think that we need. Because we believe that God is our creator and that God loves us and we can be assured that God knows us. I talked about that last week, right? God knows us. And as God knows us even better than we know ourselves, God provides for us. But it takes faith because we have to believe those things. We have to put our faith in those 
truths that scripture tells us about who God is and who we are. And all throughout scripture, you read and hear about stories from the Hebrew scriptures all the way to the New Testament of how God has provided for God's people from liberating them from enslavement to wandering alongside and guiding them in the wilderness to ultimately sending Christ, God's precious son, to die on the cross for us and to Christ's resurrection. And this provision was not only for humanity, but it was for the birds in the sky and the flowers in the field, right? That's why we can sing songs like this. So then, so then, how much more will God provide for those who have been created in their likeness? And as is evident in the story of Jesus feeding the 15,000, there is more than enough when it comes to God's provision. There is always an abundance. We do not have to hold on to a scarcity mindset when considering God's provision. There is more than enough for all of us. There is an abounding of grace, of love, of mercy, of kindness, of forgiveness. It is so lavish. Right in John 10, 10, it says this, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And in other translations, a full life that they may have it more abundantly. So abundance, there is no scarcity in the kingdom of God. There is an abundance. And here is the second thing. We may already have what we need. I don't know about this young boy, but man, his mama raised him right. I mean, he came prepared. He had the foresight to grab a Lunchable on his way out to follow Jesus. He knew, well, Jesus can get talking and you don't want to miss anything. And um, you don't want to miss anything that Jesus says. But he was also self-aware that he knew that he would probably need a snack while listening to the words of Jesus. And so we don't know. Maybe some others brought some food too or maybe they didn't. But regardless, though, something in this young child prompted him to speak. He spoke up and said, here is what I have to offer. And I think I can safely say this. I think Jesus knew that this boy had this food and that he knew that this child was going to actually offer it up. And that's all Jesus needed. But Andrew, the disciple, says, what good is that with this huge crowd? What good is it? What Andrew didn't realize is that it was good. It was the perfect offering that was needed to feed this huge crowd. Now, I work a lot with children and youth, and, and they are my heart, like my heart. And what I have noticed in my work with them, though, is that our society tends to dismiss or minimize them, and we don't treat them as full human beings, that they are somehow less than. And you know, I get it. There's a toddler in my program who takes her goldfish, lets it sit in her apple juice or water until they're all mushy, and then drinks the concoction weekly. <laughs> it's not my cup of tea, but... And then I have a kindergartner who's obsessed these days with writing the word poop everywhere. And so a couple of Sundays ago, I noticed that the, at the end of our memory verse that's hanging up in our children's room, in, it, it, it's in Philippians, and he had written poop <laughs> in large letters after Philippians, whatever the verse was. But don't tell him, he's actually one of my favorite kids in our kids' program. Sometimes our kids do things that as adults would not be able to do when we are adulting. And sometimes what that translates to is that we discount the things that they might say or do because of that. Some of the most profound theological and spiritual conversations I have had are with kids and youth. In fact, when, when the church that I am currently serving at, uh, at right now started their discernment process on what it meant for our church to be inclusive, and sorry, no, I forgot to tell you, but I'm gonna talk about you for a little bit. <laughs> My child said to me, I don't know what the problem is. Doesn't Jesus tell us to love everyone? And they're so correct. Jesus does command us to love everyone. There are no qualifiers. There's no conditions to the love that comes from Jesus. It is simply to love others as we love ourselves. And then Jesus embodies himself like us, lays down his life for us, for all of us. There are no conditions that had to be met by us in order for Jesus to die on that cross. You see, it says in Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. 
Whew, can you sit with that for a minute? That's radical love. Radical. But this is what my child simply stated, that this radical love is what Jesus calls us to love each other with as well. And that, that might be really challenging for some of you to hear. But when you think about your church, have you considered that we already have what we need? Amen. That the ministries you're hoping for, or the ones that you miss, or the ones that you wish were here, that it might already actually be happening? Amen. Maybe it's not formalized, but that ministry might already be happening. Or maybe that ministry is being advocated for by someone you would least expect. I know that you're in a season of transition, but don't wait. Don't wait thinking, oh, when the right person comes, we can do X, Y, Z. No. What is God already doing? Who is God already using right now? Look around. Whatever you need, it may already be here. Whomever you need, they may already be sitting right next to you. But don't look in the obvious places. Look all around you really carefully and consider that what you need and what this community needs is already here. And let God reveal that to you instead of thinking of a human solution or what you can do in your human power. Who or what are those two fish and five loaves that will be multiplied with leftovers? That miracle may already be happening, so don't miss it. Don't miss it. And finally, when you shift from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset, then, then we can talk about here, how do you use what you have to be a good neighbor? Well, first, you've got to offer what you have. You see, the young boy offered what he had. It wasn't much in anyone's eyes, really, but it was what was needed. And I'm going to invite you to be free with what you have. Don't hoard your resources, your energy, and your time. And now, I don't mean don't have boundaries. Of course not. You should have boundaries. You've got to take care of yourself, right? You've got to love yourself. But what I am saying here is to offer what you have, even if it seems like it's not much. You don't know how God is going to use that. And if you want to see that, you've got to offer it first. So what does it mean for New City to be a good neighbor here in downtown LA? That's something that I hope that we will all discern together. Because some of you have been a part of this church for a long time. And for some of you, you are here at New City because you're sensing from God, from the Holy Spirit, of how you want to be a good neighbor. And for some of you, you live here. This is your home. So I want you to take a moment to stop and listen to God. What is God whispering? Where is God already moving? Where do you think the Holy Spirit is prompting you and the church? So stop, listen, consider, and then listen again. And then take a look at what you have and see where there might be congruence, where, that thing, where all those things line up. The young boy looked at what he had, some food, and looked around and saw that people needed food because they were hungry. And even though he knew that it was humanly impossible to feed all 15,000 with what he had, he still offered it. We often think that we have to be in the right place with all our ducks in a row in order to offer anything. But God isn't looking for that. Because God is powerful. God is a God of miracles. Do you believe that? But God does want your participation, your willingness. So maybe God is saying to you even today, hey, will you offer your two fish and five loaves? Will you offer your one Saturday or your Sunday? Will you offer your design skills? Will you offer your muscles to help set up and break down stuff for church? Will you offer your listening ear? Will you offer your humor and jokes like Freddie does? Will you offer your
Your positivity like Phil does. I have never met sunshine embodied in a person. Phil is literally sunshine like bottled up in a human body. Will you offer your weightlifting expertise at the Union Rescue Mission Gym? That sounds weird, right? But I went there this week. And I got to visit URM and I got to worship together at their town hall. And then what I just kept hearing was the importance of partnering with local churches so that we can become those places of accountability and community for those who live there and are part of the program at URM. Not, not for someone to come in and like come up with solutions, but for some, someone to just come and hang out, lift weights together. I could probably use that. That's why I wear this jacket, because I, I don't have guns. What is it that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to offer today for this church, for this community, for you to be a good neighbor, for us to be a good neighbor? And not only to love just the ones that you love, right? But to those of us that are all around us, even the strangers. And as you offer what you have and you come alongside in community, you can offer these things together and, and, and you're going to discern the best ways to do so. And you're going to inspire each other to collectively say, oh yeah, I see God moving here. And then you're going to move in abundance because there is more than enough from God's power, God's strength, and God's love. Let it pour out of you. My hope is that together we can share the abundance that is here at New City with the community that we are a part of here in downtown LA. And throughout this week I have met with so many of you. And you all have beautiful things to offer. And there is an abundance of what you have to offer. And what I have heard from all of you is a longing to love your neighbor in the ways of Jesus. And I have been inspired by that, inspired to rekindle our relationship with Union Rescue Mission and to consider the exciting ways that we can partner and do life together with our URM siblings. I have been inspired to consider the ways that the justice team could advocate for how justice can flow like a mighty river right here at New City. From the way that we worship to the policies that we have to the ways that we care for one another to stand in solidarity with those who are part of this church family and then to fight alongside for the things that are important to them and necessary for their flourishing. I have been inspired for our families that are part of this church and how our next gen pastors, Anthony and Linda, will continue to not just create programs, but lean in to discipling our children in the ways of Jesus so that we can invest in the future of God's kingdom through our next generation. And I've been inspired by people like our brother Freddie, who has a heart for mental health and bringing awareness and making resources more accessible. So here's the thing, beloved. You have all of this already. God's abundance to love your neighbor is actually already here. So let it just pour out of you. Amen. I wanted to end this time with a breath prayer that has been so meaningful to me. And it comes from Psalm 23. And I say this often, especially when I feel like I don't have anything to give. So a breath prayer is this. It's, it's where you inhale and say a phrase and then you exhale and you say that second phrase. And I have it up here on the screen behind me. And so we're going to inhale the words, the Lord is my shepherd. And exhale, I have all that I need. Can we try that together? You can say the prayer out loud or you can say it to yourself. And we're going to do this twice. Inhale, the Lord is my shepherd. Exhale, I have all that I need. One more time. Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Beloved, you have all that you need because the Lord is our shepherd and provides for us. Let's pray. God, it's 
some of us, we come with you and we, we just don't, we don't have anything. We don't have material things. We don't, like, we're just emotionally, we're, we don't have anything. And it feels like we don't have anything to give. But God, would you help us to see ourselves the way that you see us so that we can see that we actually do have something to give? And Lord, that when we sing words about how you provide, that we can step out in faith, that we can take that to heart and say, God, my life, it sure doesn't feel like you're providing for me. So can you help me, help me have a little bit of faith so that I can see how you are providing? And for some of us, we're scared, and it's scary, God, to offer, because what if there's not enough for me? What if there isn't enough?